much. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be take part in this wonderful occasion, Poincaré seminar here. Um, I think it's going to be a very exciting day, as I can judge from the lectures and from the speakers. And uh, so my talk is probably going to be a little bit different in the sense that I will try to give some more personal remarks, uh, partly based on, on, on my own experience with my grandfather, but also just what I've, through my work, I'm also a physicist, have, have thought about uh, uh, Niels Bohr. And, and the problem I'm kind of going to address is, uh, so what was it that made it possible for Niels Bohr to, cre to, to have this very creative environment around him? And uh, one thing you can see is that in this auditorium that he used, it's the same kind of very unpleasant wooden uh, uh, benches. So maybe that's one of the signs of great creativity, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, I mean, it was ama amazing that through the 30s and the 20s, he could really collect some of the best minds, some of the most creative minds around him. And I've tried to ask, what are the personal traits that make this possible? And I think after my talk, John Halbrun will give some much more qualified it's on some, essentially some of the same things, especially around the period of 1913. So, um, so one thing was that, uh, so these are really, I'm, I'm not a specialist in, in I'm not a historian, uh, I'm just a scientist. So, uh, but my feeling was that he had an enormous courage. So he, he, he was, he, he had the courage to take up some of the most important problems at the time even though he was very well aware that he didn't really have the tools to solve them. He just felt this was the most important points to address. And of course, there's, some, there's an interesting, I just like with a, this little bit long citation, but it's kind of interesting because when he got the Nobel Prize in 1922, he gave a, a Nobel speech, but he also gave a talk after dinner. And at the dinner, he kind of places himself in some sense uh, the, the way he does science. And uh, what he writes here is that when the great experimental discoveries around the turn of the century uh, in which investigators from many countries took such a prominent part gave us an unsuspected insight into the constitutions of atoms, we owe th this above all to the great researchers of the English school, Sir Joseph Thompson and Sir Ernest Rutherford, who have inscribed their names in the history of science as shining examples of how imagination and acute insight are capable of looking through the multiplicity of experiences and laying bare to our eyes the simplicity of nature. On the other hand, abstract thought, which has always been one of the mankind's most powerful aids in lifting the veil that conceals the laws of nature to the immediate observer, has been of decisive significance for applying the insight gained into atomic structure to explain the properties of the elements directly accessible to our senses. Also in this work, men of many nations have made important contributions. But it was the great German scientists Planck and Einstein who, through their abstract and systematic studies, first taught us that the laws holding for the motion of atomic particles, which govern the properties of the elements, are of an essentially different nature than the laws by which science hitherto had, uh, uh, had attempted to order our observations of the phenomena of nature. That it has been my undeserved good fortune to be a connecting link at a stage in this development is only one piece of evidence among many of the fruitfulness in the world of science of the closest possible intercommunication of research work developing under different human conditions. So this is very flourishing words and of course it's a dinner party and so on but I think there are some important things in that because first of all he places himself between these English uh, experimenters who just threw themselves into science and found some amazing things and then the Germans who were much more uh, deductive and tried to do everything from the beginning and he, he was aware that if he wanted to solve the atom he couldn't just start from the beginning he had to start with some strange observation like the one made by Rutherford. The other thing is that that he also <laughs> mentions collaboration, international collaborations in, in science which of course in the rest of his life or the, through his whole life was a very important thing for him. So this is Niels Bohr at the time which we are kind of celebrating this year. So this is 1912. He's going back to Denmark from England. He's in his head are these uh, spirals because he knows that the atoms are somehow unstable. The atom proposed by Rutherford is completely unstable. It's, the electron will spiral into the nucleus and he's kind of, you can see that he's really speculating how he's going to solve that problem. And we all know that the way he solved that problem in this, uh, so he wrote these 71 pages in, in, in um, 
uh, philosophical magazine on not just the structure of atoms, but the structure of atoms and molecules. He was a very ambitious young man. And, um, and we know that what he really did was he solved it by way of these very strange postulates. So he basically said, and I know I don't have to explain this to this audience, but he's basically saying, I cannot explain the stability of the atoms. I'm just going to assume that they are stable, at least that there are some states that are stable. And the only way you see the atom is when the uh, electron jumps from one of these states to another state. And, and from that he could, and this is of course what made great impression at the time, he could deduce the Balmer formula so he could connect these um, things from light, which was the spectrum of hydrogen, to something having to do with matter. Matter, so the properties of the electron, the electron um, uh, charge and mass, and the, of course Planck's constant, which he for a long time knew that somehow that had to enter the game. So it's in, very amusing to see when he sent this paper, he sent it off to Rutherford, so it was not, not really any referee uh, for the paper, but he sent it to Rutherford, and, and Rutherford would then send it on to the paper, and Rutherford's reaction was interesting because he thought it was very interesting, but then he says, um, I'm sure you, um, so he says, there appears to me one grave difficulty in your hypothesis, which I have no doubt you fully realize. Namely, how does an electron decide what frequency it's going to vibrate at when it passes from one state to the other? It seems to me that you would have to assume that the electron knows beforehand where it's going to stop. And of course, maybe I didn't say that very clearly, but Niels Bohr had completely uh, separated the frequency of the light of the electron in its rotation and the frequency of the light was, which was emitted because in his uh, famous formula which you see here uh, here he related the energy the frequency that is sent out by the electron to the difference in energy between the two states and so this was one critique. The other critique was the paper was way too long. And he says, I suppose you have no objection to my using my judgment and cut out any matter I may consider unnecessary in your paper. Please reply. So Bohr's reply was to hurry to Cambridge and fight for every word in his paper, which he actually succeeded in. Um, so when we think about these, these um, postulates now, they seem kind of reasonable to us. We also have heard so much about quantum mechanics. So if we turn back a little bit, we have to realize that these were really very, very, very strange postulates. Because when you, for example, say that you separate the frequency that the electron is revolving with, with the frequency of the light, then you are actually saying that you cannot really describe an electron by an orbit. If you're really following it, and you can follow it in detail around, then it has to emit some light which is somehow related to that frequency. So the questions that Rutherford raised were ex extremely important. So not only can you not really describe any orbits, but also, as Rutherford pointed out, the atomic processes going from one state to the other, you can't really say you know, what happens on the way, how is the electron sending out that. It's a kind of complete process, complete phenomenon of a nature that we haven't experienced before and it therefore also breaks with maybe the most cherished principle in physics at all, which is causality. So there's no clear causality. Electron jumps because the light is coming or how, how are these things related? It's not very clear. Um, so this was one trait of Niels Bohr's mind. And the other was that he had an incredible stamina and intensity and, and simply raw power. He could keep going for endlessly. And you can see that in his uh, collected works are published very beautiful uh, volumes. It's 12 volumes. It's quite, there's commentary in, the, commentary in there too. There are papers, there are letters, there are applications. They're not in the collected volumes, but he wrote an enormous amount of letters. Um, and uh, one other thing was that some of the stamina also made it, was also at the basis for getting some of the best minds to his institute. Because he was asked in first in 20, 1921 and later in 1922, uh, because he sort of became a little stressed, sick in 1921, so he had to postpone. But he was asked to come to Göttingen and give a series of lectures. And he did that in the summer of 1922. And he gave ten, ten lectures, uh, se sorry, seven lectures in ten days. Where, and, and we still have the notes from the lectures, and you can see he basically told everything he knew, which was quite a lot, 
But there were also many holes, and what he did was he really emphasized where there were need of more work and which and what the things were that people didn't understand. And I think for these two guys, who then became very close associates with him and came to Copenhagen for Heisenberg was 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 hired in Copenhagen for a period and, and Wolfgang Pauli was a, of course a very frequent visitor. They for them, it was a different experience because they met a person who didn't really try to explain how beautiful the whole thing fit together, but more tried to, to explain how much was needed, how deep the problems were that they were confronted with. And also, especially Heisenberg uh, emphasizes that, that very much in his writings, that they made a person which has a very great philosophical interest. But it took some stamina to give seven lectures in ten days. And uh, another occasion which is very famous is that when Schrodinger had made his, his, um, his wave equation, Heisenberg had heard him speak in, in, in Berlin and, and was, it didn't like it at all, of course. And this is, of course, very much because of the interpretation of the wave function. And then they invited him to Copenhagen, and he came and gave a lecture, and then they started discussing with him. And the discussions just kept going because, of course, Schrodinger believed that you could really interpret the wave function as a kind of charge distribution of the electron. And Niels Bohr and Heisenberg tried to convince him that this was not so. And uh, Schrodinger became sick and he had to go to bed. He was living with Niels Bohr at the institute. But, of course, Niels Bohr just followed him to the bedside and kept discussing with him until Schrodinger was basically desperate. And, uh, Heisenberg describes it sort of here. So, for, for though Bohr was an unusually considerate and obliging person, he was able in such a discussion which concerned epistemo epistemological problems, which he considered to be of vital importance, to insist fanatically and with almost terrifying relentlessness on complete clarity in all arguments. So, he could be pretty much of a bulldozer, actually. Uh, there's an interesting uh, small story which was told around the, when Niels Bohr was 70, um, which uh, close to that time. Uh, so he, he had an old school friend, O. Berlem, who knew him from childhood. And Berlem writes the following here. It sounds like a paradox, but during all the years when Niels was a small boy, I actually remember him as a very big boy. He was large of body, rather roughly hewn, and strong like a bear while I was the youngest in the class and a skinny little kid. In those years, Niels was certainly not afraid of using his strength and was always involved when there was a fight. Fights were then very common during the school breaks and even took place outside the school at St. Anne Square. I don't know what we were fighting about at the time, but Niels acquired a reputation as a strong boy, one can say a violent boy, since during his entire childhood, he had problems judging the range of his actions, and probably many of the bloody noses he handed out were not intentional. He has beaten me numerous times. So, another very important... These things are a little, little bit hard to distinguish from each other, but that was a, a very strong ability to think concretely about things. So he made physical problems very, very concrete. And uh, one case, one very famous case, which I think we'll return to several times today, is this famous double slit experiment, which of course is sort of a prototype of a, of a real quantum system. And, um, and it was a, very much at the center of the discussions between Niels Bohr and Einstein. And this, you can say, is basically kind of Einstein's or the standard drawing of it, but the concreteness meant that when Niels Bohr tried to explain his opinion on, on that or explain why it should work in a certain way, he made it very clear that you had to really think about how are you going to make this experimentally. So, of course, this is maybe not meant completely realistic, but he was saying that it's very important you have to decide here whether you completely fix this screen here. That means you fix these two slits both with respect to this one and with respect to the screen where you measure and with respect to each other. And you can do that by really bolting them into the under, uh, to, the, to the substrate. So, but this, on, on the other hand, makes it impossible to measure any momentum which is taken up. If you want to see what way the particle is going, well, then you have to make a system where you, where you measure the momentum of the particle. But that's a different experiment, because you can still have the bolts here, but now you have a spring, so this can actually move.
And so he thought very concretely about that, and I think it was a very great aid for him. He was used to, from his childhood, he loved to, to uh, he, was, he was famous for taking bicycle completely apart, and everybody was very worried, but then he actually put it back together again. So uh, he could do that. Then there was a, another thing which I think is actually pretty seldom, and actually for myself it's also a difficulty, and I don't know how many of what you feel about it, but this is, he, he wasn't afraid of being wrong. And uh, there are some, in very many cases, uh, he wrote several wrong papers, uh, and, and, and I, but there's a very wonderful description in, in Otto Robert Frisch, he has written this, this very wonderful biography called What Little I Remember. So Otto Robert Frisch, of course, was a German who had to flee and, and stayed for some time in Copenhagen. And so he writes about the, the atmosphere in Copenhagen. Uh, from time to time, there was alarming news of some experimental result which appeared to contradict what we knew. Such a contradiction was an enemy immediately to be attacked, against which Niels Bohr turned the full power of his mind. Sometimes it turned out that the experiment had simply been wrong and everybody was relieved, but on other occasions Niels Bohr would tell us with even greater delight that it was he who had made a mistake, that the inconsistency disappeared when one had found the right way to think about it. He never hesitated for one moment to admit that he had been in error. To him it merely meant that he now understood things better and what could have made him happier. Uh, there's a famous example uh, when, when Sommerfeld wrote his paper in 1916 uh, showing that you have ellipses. I mean, you maybe cannot say that Niels Bohr was wrong, but I mean, he, he had only found the circular orbits, and he was writing a big paper about that, uh, about the application of quantum theory to, to the atoms, and suddenly this Sommerfeld paper comes and completely wipes out his paper, actually. So he wrote back, and this was actually during the First World War, so Niels Bohr was back in, in, in Manchester, and he writes uh, to Sommerfeld, I thank you so much for your most interesting and beautiful papers. I do not think that I've ever enjoyed the reading of anything more than I enjoyed the study of them. And I need not say that not only I, but everybody here has taken the greatest interest in your important and beautiful results. And then later he writes, the intention of writing all this is only to tell you how exceedingly glad I was to receive your papers before my paper was published. I decided at once to postpone the publication and to consider it all again in view of all for which your papers have opened my eyes. And then he ends up by hoping that the world war will, will soon end. And he yeah. delayed his paper by two years because of this. Um, so Niels Bohr had a great joy, I think, out of his family. That was something that meant a lot to him. Somehow he was able to combine being a very hard worker and having a family and actually using, seemingly using a lot of energy on the family too. And so just to show some pictures, uh, this is the light section before the whole thing starts today, so we can enjoy some pictures maybe. And uh, so this is his father, his brother Harald, who became a mathematician, and Nils himself, and his mother, and his sister Jenny. And you see him a little bit bigger here, and you can see, you, you might think this is a little girl, but this is actually Harald, his brother. And this is, we might think that's a boy, but that's Jenny, his sister, and this is Nils himself. Looking slightly, I don't know, uh, he could, I guess he could fall into himself and kind of... Um, his, he had a very special relation with his brother. Uh, his brother was always called in when there was a problem. His brother was very sharp and clear and very different from himself. And uh, this picture was taken around 1902. Hal sent it to Nils as a gift um, when Nils was in Cambridge with the following letter on it, a small part of which runs as follows where Harl tries to describe their two characters. So Harl writes, um, I think it symbolizes a certain aspect of our relationship with one another, my impudence and your being a little embarrassed on my behalf, but also as it was I who said it, and as we have always been a little fond of each other, then you think nevertheless in all your niceness that it was nevertheless quite amusing to have such an impudent little brother. <laughs> It's very beautifully translated uh, by Finn Oserud. It's almost impossible. Actually, in the, in the wonderful new book by, by John Heilbrunn and Finn Oserud, it appears also. In 1909, he met his wife, Margrethe, who, who became his lifelong companion, and, and they shared everything. Um, he got a lot of children. 
you know, all his, uh, his, his sons here, and my father is sitting there. Um, this is, the grandchildren begun, began to come there in the beginning of the 40s, so this is the first grandchild at his summer house here. And uh, this is a group of us here, of his grandchildren and children. And of course, just to put, to put myself into perspective, this is my own father, who at the day when he received his doctorate, one year after I was born. And uh, here you see kind of the daily life in the family a few years after that. Uh, and you see that I'm trying to, <laughs> to learn something too. Uh, and you can see that he took lively part in our education, so he is trying to teach my sister to, to eat, I think. Uh, um, okay, so in the last minutes, I'll say, so, so one thing, as I mentioned before, he had a great philosophical outlook. So he, if you asked him a question, he would typically tell a story. He loved that very much. He collected stories like other people collect stamps, for example. Uh, and he could make often very surprising comparisons and another thing which his philosophy gave him also, which he basically never gave up. Uh, so this is a famous example where he's, he's explaining in America and, and uh, some lectures he gave uh, the concept of a compound nucleus. And I think the compound nucleus was a very exciting new idea. He wrote a paper in 1936 which, is, which essentially has no formulas in it, but it has this uh, wonderful picture which is given right here. And his idea was that you can actually think of the nucleus. You, people thought about the nucleus. So what happened was that people started bombarding. Maybe I should just read this little thing here by, by Frisch again, which is wonderful. Uh, so the, it, the neutron had been discovered. And so he says, since we now had a neutron source, we were able to repeat and extend some of the experiments which Fermi had done in Rome and which had puzzled us considerably. So the whole new Spohr Institute had been switched to do nuclear physics in the beginning of the 30s. In particular, there was his discovery that slow neutrons had so much more effect on certain nuclei than fast ones. According to what was then believed about nuclei, a neutron should pass clean through the nucleus with only a small chance of being captured. Hans Bethe in the US had tried to calculate that chance, and I remember a colloquium in 1935 when some speaker reported on that paper. On that occasion, Bohr kept interrupting and I was beginning to wonder with some irritation why he didn't let the speaker finish. Then in the middle of a sentence, Bohr suddenly stopped and sat down, his face completely dead. We looked at him for several seconds, getting anxious, and taken unwell, but then he suddenly got up and said with an apologetic smile, now I understand it. So what he understand, had understood was you, you should think about the nucleus not as something that you just go through but when you go into the nucleus, you hit all these particles and then they start wobbling around and it gets to be a kind of excited, almost thermodynamic system which can last for a long time and then after that something happens. And then you could begin to understand why there were so many possible um, resonances and possibilities that could come out of this. And also you realize that some of the low resonances, uh, low states of the system were actually collective modes. Then in um, 1934, the, he had the biggest uh, tragedy in his life. His oldest son, Christian, who was very talented both artistically and scientifically, uh, drowned. In a, he went with his father and his friend on a sailing trip and drowned. And uh, Niels Bohr wrote about that in a very beautiful way. So he wrote, a, so it, it was a terrible tragedy. It took them a long time to come over it. But one way was to collect all the young people that were friends of Christians and, and, he, and, and, wrote, and, and Niels Bohr wrote something about that. And he ends up by saying that each of us probably lives his strongest life in the thoughts of his fellow human beings. And to me that's always been a very soothing thought, very nice thought, and I think that, that it was an example of this kind of philosophy of life which I think make, made it possible for Niels Bohr to, to go through all sorts of turmoils. Another occasion where he, I th think he showed his philosophical inclinations was in the famous discussions with Einstein where, you know, Einstein said, God doesn't play dice. And Niels Bohr said something like, don't tell God what to do. It, not, I mean, something like that at least. And I think that was very much Bohr's point of view. You didn't know, so 
uh, when he went, he went all the way to the top, managed to talk to both Roosevelt and to Churchill, and Churchill with not much success. And uh, my father was present, not at the meeting with Churchill, but my father was sitting outside waiting. And when Niels Bohr came out, he was not in very good spirits because it had been a terrible meeting with, well, with uh, Churchill. But his first remark was, was, now let's make a new version of our memorandum, you know, because apparently he had not made it clear enough, so they had to go right back to work. So never give up. So, yeah, so finally to keep things open was of course one of the main, almost like a way of life for him. And uh, he's very clear, so this is also what I said before about making clear how much you still needed to understand. So at a lecture already in 1913, or in, in 1913, right after the publication of the paper, he gave a popular, more popular lecture in the Danish Physical Society, and there he says, after his, his atomic theory, you will therefore understand that I shall not attempt to propose an explanation of the spectral laws. On the contrary, I shall try to indicate a way in which it appears possible to bring the spectral laws into close connection with other properties of the elements which appear equally inexplicable on the basis of the present state of science. Another thing was that he always felt that you should not express yourself more clearly than you, th you were thinking. So it's very important to write in a way that you are not trying to say too much. So for example, there's this formulation in the paper on complementarity, which was published in Nature in 1928. So he says, the hindrances in formulating the quantum laws originate above all in the fact that, so to say, every word in the language refers to our ordinary perceptions. In the quantum theory, we meet this difficulty at once in the question of the inner inevitability of the feature of irrationality characterizing the quantum postulate. I mean, this is a kind of a sentence you have to think about a few times before you really see what he means. And for example, you can ask yourself, why does he say the question of the inevitability? And for me, it's a little bit also because probably he considers the question of the, uh, he considers the question of whether something is ir irrational or not is probably also a linguistic question to some extent. So he, he puts many caveats into his texts which are often very difficult, but they have also been able to keep for many years. So I, th I think in a way he was right in doing that, but they are difficult to, to read. Now to the very end I just want to say that, the, so, so he, for the rest, after the, after the atomic bomb, his life really became very much centered around trying to get this to become something of, uh, that could make, uh, that would be good for mankind instead of something would be, which would be terrible. And he wrote this uh, open letter to the UN in 1950, uh, and the essential points of that were that, first of all, we are now in possession of a terrible weapon, completely different to anything else we know, and we, it cannot really be used as a weapon because we can't fight against it. It's based on technology which is actually known. So in the long run we will not be able to keep this a secret. So we basically have two possibilities. We can give, say, the Russians the secret or we can uh, try to keep it from them. But then they will find it out by themselves. So if we use the first option, then we can actually maybe gain some openness which is not good for dictatorial uh, countries. And Maybe we can use our um, experience in international collaboration as a model to do this. And this was kind of what he tried to work for. It, I don't have to tell you probably that he was not very successful in doing that. Although you can say that some sort of openness had, has probably appeared now through the internet and through many other things. Um, so if I just... Uh, citing a small passage from, the, from that um, open letter. So he says, looking back at those days, i.e. the end of the war, I find it difficult to convey with sufficient vividness the fervent hopes that the progress of science might initiate a new era of harmonious cooperation between nations and the anxieties lest any opportunity to promote such a development be forfeited. Thank you very much.